All right, welcome to Sunrise Bible Church. You guys ready to get started tonight? Yes. All right. As always, I got a couple announcements to get through. I want to start with the Holy Trinity Medical Practice. It's Faithful Medicine by Dr. Michael Kane. There's um, Dr. Mick and Nurse Heather in action over here in the mobile trailer. We have our telehealth number um, up and running for the state of Nevada. So if you live in Nevada and you're unable to make an appointment with Dr. Mick, you can call him on this phone number. Um, <clears throat> I really don't understand why Dr. Mick doesn't have more patients than he does. We have a lot more members here at Sunrise than he does patients. And I don't know if you guys realize what a valuable resource uh, having a doctor you can trust is. Or I guess you could trust Pfizer because nothing says trust the science like asking the data to be hidden for 75 years. So I would go with uh, Dr. Mick over here at the Holy Trinity Medical Practice or you can continue to go to the Pfizer depopulation centers and get another shot. So it's all about choices. So I'm giving you the choice. And I'm thinking the Holy Trinity Medical Practice is probably a pretty solid choice. Um, all we can do is warn you. That's all we can do. Holy Trinity Medical Practice is cards are out front. Speaking of which, we're almost done building this building down here. we got about maybe a month left to go. And um, I've been thinking about some graphics for his front door. Um, so this is the front runner so far. So I'm thinking uh, that would look pretty good on the front window of the doctor that I'm going to go and see for medical advice. So once again, that's the Holy Trinity Medical Center with Dr. Mick Kane. Uh, if you have not done so already, please make your appointment with these guys. Uh, we also have Sunday school, um, at, uh, both 9 and 1045 service uh, every Sunday with Christina. Um, and we also have Arlene with the homeschool. And um, <clears throat> I think this is um, outside of the medical services that uh, are being offered. Probably the next most underrated, underappreciated programs that this church has uh, Arlene does an amazing job with this homeschool co-op. Um, try to get you guys to get your kids out of the sewer pipe and into the homeschool, or you can go with what they're teaching in public school, which is these types of subjects, but that's probably not true. The teachers don't really do that. Well, you know, maybe that teacher probably does it, but the kids aren't buying into it, but Okay, maybe some of the kids are buying. Okay, just bring your kids down here for the Arlene's co-op at homeschool and get them out of the sewer pipe. Uh, you can go with this agenda, or you can get on a Christ-based agenda with Arlene and the homeschool group. <coughs> we also have Tyndale Seminary, um, if you guys want to get involved. We are just finishing up um, our module right now, so right now is the time to enroll for new classes. It'll start, I believe, I believe it's October 23rd, if my mind's not completely clouded. Um, we're learning how to divide the Word of God correctly over there. And just as an example to show you um, how perilous it can be if you don't read the word correctly, you can run into things like, like this. And if you don't read that the right way, you might go swimming there. So come on over and learn to divide the word of God correctly. Tyndale Theological Bible Study. And um, you can handle the word of God in a way you never thought possible. Uh, and we'd love to have you shoot me an email at jdhsunrise at gmail.com. We also have um, Brandy Crone doing the women's Bible study every Tuesday night. Um, lots of ladies are involved in this. I encourage anybody who's not to get involved. If you're wondering what they're doing over there, they're equipping these ladies to fight in this spiritual battle against the wicked world that we live in right alongside us men. So get with Brandy for Tuesday night. She has an amazing study. And guys, don't feel left out. We have Jim Jubinville every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Does his Bible study down here in our... Uh, new fellowship building, and if you're wondering what they're doing down there, they're doing the same thing. They're getting equipped with the Word of God. Um, got some godly men down there, so it's a good, uh, a good program to get plugged in with. And we have our new prayer hall ministry that you can um, meet right here on the other side of the sanctuary after first and second service, and um, we've got guys over there that will pray with you. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, if you want to uh, sign up for any of these wonderful ministries to, uh, to help, please get with one of these four ladies who are fully equipped uh, with the armor of God and ask them how you can help serve. 
And finally, if you just want to become a new member, you want to join the army, you want to fight with us, there's a new member sign-up sheet out in the foyer. I encourage you guys to get your name on the list if you have not done so already. Um, Pastor Billy's latest study, Carl Schwab, Eugenics and the Rise of the Nephilim. I know some of you guys, especially if you like drove all the way from Minnesota, we're kind of hoping to see Billy tonight, but you got stuck with me. So I got this one slide for you guys. You can, I'll keep it up there for me. Take a picture of it or something if you want. But you can go to his website, getalifemedia.com, and you can download the uh, DVD, the book, uh, 12 years worth of teaching on his website at your access. So uh, feel free to go there and get into it. We have our very own Bible conference coming right here to our little church in the desert. November 11th and 12th with three giant prophecy speakers. Um, it's free, but uh, you have to go online and register so we can be prepared for the people that are coming. So if you haven't done so already, please go online and register for the Sunrise Prophecy Conference. And after you're done registering, go straight over to don'tletthemburn.com and get your Sunrise Bible Conference t-shirt, uh, don'tletthemburn.com. Finally... Um, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, October 8th, the return of Pastor Billy Crone. We're going to have Family Sunday. We're going to have uh, one service. There won't be two services, so don't show up early or you'll be out there drinking coffee with uh, Mark and those guys for about an hour and a half. But 1045, uh, we're going to serve the Lord's Supper. We're going to have a food truck afterwards. I'm working on having a, um, an ice cream vendor here so you guys come hungry try to help out our vendors so that they can uh, make it worth their while to show up for our event. Um, and we get to submit our questions to uh, Pastor Billy. So <clears throat> not that I'm a smart aleck, but I wanted to take advantage of this. So I drafted a question and I sent it to Billy because I thought this was a good chance for me to get away with something. So I wrote to him and I said, Dear Pastor Billy, can you please explain the doctrine of election in essay form? Please write your answer logically, persuasively, and focused on the assigned topic, including the introduction that informs the reader concerning the subject of the doctrine of election and a conclusion that summarizes your main points and expresses your resulting conclusions. <clears throat> the deacon you love the most, John. Well, Billy wrote back and he said, Dear John, nice try, but I'm not going to write your research paper for the theology class. You need to do your own research. Love, Pastor Bill. So I submitted another question, and I put, knowing what you know now, would you still want me to be the head deacon? To which he has not replied. So I'm not sure what's going to happen when he gets back. <clears throat> All right. Welcome, you guys, from Minnesota. It's a pleasure to have you here. Let's get down to business. If you guys would stand with me. We are going to read the Word of God. Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Picking up where we left off last week in verses 7 to 14. Matthew 18, chapter 7. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks will come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands and two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to, serve, to save that which is lost. What do you think if any man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy tonight. We come humbly, Lord, as we turn to your word. 
And we ask, Lord, that you would just reveal its meaning to us and that you would reveal its application to us, something that would be useful that we could apply to our lives to bring you glory, Lord, and to bring us all closer to you. We ask that you edify everybody that's here tonight, Lord. I thank you for everybody that came to here tonight. Um, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. As always, it is a great honor and a privilege to be here with you tonight. I cherish these opportunities that Pastor Billy and God allow for me to teach from this pulpit. When we were together last Wednesday, we studied the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, and we looked at the first six verses. You will remember that the title of that message was Humility, and we saw the need for humility in the heart and life of a Christian. We looked at examples of humility throughout the Holy Scriptures from Moses to Jesus, we looked at how Jesus used a small child as an example of the level of humility needed to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we saw that it is not just our need to change and become humble like a little child, but we need to be desolate of earthly pride to enter the kingdom of heaven, to be great in the sight of God. Humility is the result of the absence of pride. And you will remember that Jesus used the little child as an illustration of a born-again Christian, a new believer in him. He was using the Greek word paideon, translated in English to child, meaning infant or very small child. He used this in Matthew 18, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. But when we got to verse 6, we saw that word change to mikros, translated in English to little ones, and the meaning was small in size, hence of stature, small in terms of time, brief or a little while, small in rank and influence. But whoever causes one of these little ones, Mikros, who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus was talking about born-again believers, recent converts, and he gave his apostles a stern warning not to be a stumbling block to one of these Pideon infants, new believers in him. It would be better off for that person that causes one of these little ones to sin if they were drowned in the depths of the sea. We pick up the action tonight in verse 7, and right out the gate, Jesus gives us two woes. Let's get into it. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through whom the stumbling blocks come. Woe. This is the Greek word, uahi, and it is a strong expression of grief. It is a harsh, harsh denunciation. The first woe is directed at the world. The English word world, defined by Noah Webster in his 1828 Masterpiece Dictionary, defines the word world like this, a secular life. By the world, we sometimes understand the things of this world, its pleasures and its interests. The great part of mankind that is more anxious to enjoy the world than to secure divine favor. The Greek word used here for world is cosmos, and its meaning is the government, the ungodly, and the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. Do any of you know someone that is of the world as you once were? Sure you do. To start with the members of your own family that do not confess Jesus Christ, Lord. Jesus is talking about the mass of humanity. Can you imagine the weight of grief on the heart of the Lord, knowing all things, the wickedness of the world, the black hearts of men? Jesus knows every stumbling block that has ever been placed and everyone that will ever be placed, every murder, every rape, every backstabbing, every conniving, scheming, wicked plot to hurt, harm, and destroy that was ever thought up or will ever be implemented. Uahi to the world. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. Surely the Lord is thinking of the evil that is in the world and the evil that is to come to the world, the persecution of his saints, 
the deception from our adversary, the number of people, the mass of people that call themselves Christians but do not follow Jesus or do not follow the right Jesus or the so-called Christians that come to church services, sit in our midst week in and week out, and then go and live like hell all week long. Woe to the world, Jesus warns, that there will be stumbling blocks. As he says, it is inevitable. Jesus says, uahi, to the whole world. Because he feels pity for the mass of humanity that will be ensnared into these traps. They will trip on these stumbling blocks. Then Jesus gives us the second uahi when he says, But woe to the person through whom the stumbling blocks comes. Let's look at this word, stumbling block. It is the Greek word scandalon. And its meaning is a trap, a snare, or any impediment placed in the way in causing one to stumble or fall. This woe is specific. It is specific to the person that lays the stumbling block. Pay close attention to this woe because this woe is personal. This woe is to individuals, not to the world. The obvious translation of this second woe is to anyone who causes another to stumble. And some obvious illustrations here would be to offer an alcoholic a drink or give a heroin addict some clean needles. Or how about this one? Passing out free contraceptives to young unmarried school children that are going through puberty with raging hormones and telling yourself, well, they're going to do it anyway, so I'm going to get them some protection. No. You just handed them a loaded gun and put your Christian blessing on it. You have caused them to sin against the Lord. Woe to you, says Jesus. This second woe is also an expression of grief, a harsh denunciation directed at the sinner who will be held accountable for the evil that they introduce and unleash on the world. Our actions have consequences. And like a stone thrown into a still calm body of water, the ripples reach far beyond the impact of the pebble. This is why those that have died in their sins will not be judged until the end at the great white throne judgment. After Satan has been bound for a thousand years, freed and then doomed to the lake of fire, then and only then do we read in Revelation 20 what was shown to the apostle John. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to the deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds." Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Ladies and gentlemen, this is judgment. All those rotting in hell, you think that's bad? It's just a waiting room. And in the end, you will be judged. After the effects of the unrepented wickedness that you unleashed on the world has run its full course. God cannot justly judge anyone until the end because the effects of our sin are felt far beyond the sin itself. I have one more point to make on this verse before we move on. And it applies to every one of us, to Christians. Keeping in mind the ripple effect that I just described to you, how did you become a follower of Christ? It's not a trick question. You were hostile towards God, separated from God. We were all born with the same problem, in the same helpless condition. We came into this world with a sin nature. None of us became sinners because we sinned. No, we were born sinners. Behold, I was brought forth in inequity and in sin. My mother conceived me, the great psalmist wrote. But someone, somewhere, at some point, loved you enough, cared enough, to scatter a seed in your direction. Maybe they called you out on your sin and confronted you on the way you were living. Maybe they invited you to church services. You were hostile towards God, separated from God. Maybe they were really bold and they whispered the name above all names into your ear. No matter how your circumstance, somebody loved you enough to tell you the truth. And maybe you didn't listen when that someone laid it out for you, but it didn't matter because the seed had been scattered. And that's all anyone can do is just tell the truth. It is God that does the calling and the delivering. It is God that grants us understanding. And it is God that pulls us up from the grave. God does the saving. But it starts because someone, somewhere, somehow, some way, had enough courage to speak up and point to the cross of Christ. 
Every person that turns to Christ as a result of you caring enough to tell them the truth will also be like this small stone thrown into the still pond. The ripples will extend far beyond the impact of the pebble. In this verse, Jesus says, Rahi to the world out of pity for the senseless and needless suffering directed at those that will spend a lifetime rejecting him and his free gift of salvation. But Jesus goes on to say, Rahi to the specific person that is the cause of leading someone else to sin against him. All of us Christians, followers of Christ, are in some way responsible for progressing God's plan of salvation. And to do nothing is to lay a stumbling block. To not care enough for the lost to tell them the truth, to tell them who Jesus Christ is and what he did for them on that hill at Calvary is leaving their souls in jeopardy of eternal damnation. Is there any trap or snare worse than this? Woe to the person through whom the stumbling block comes. Verse 8. And if your hand or your foot is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life maimed without a foot than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. It's a tough verse. Jesus has been teaching his disciples here a lesson on humility. And he came with a warning of how if a follower of him fails to empty themselves of pride and humble themselves as a little child, that person will not see the kingdom of heaven. And then he taught and warned that it would be better to have a heavy millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea than it would be to deal with his wrath due to treating a believer, a follower of him poorly. He went on to teach and warn about stumbling blocks that will come and woe to the one that lays one of these traps or leads another into folly. And now here in verse 8, we get some of the strongest language yet. The context is now very sharp and pointed and it is directed at you. This is about personal sin, your sin, my sin. Remember, every sin that is committed is an offense against God. Remember when Cain lifted his hand against his brother Abel? Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a wanderer and a drifter on this earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to endure. The blood of your brother cries out to me. Yes, Cain sinned against his brother, but ultimately Cain sinned against the Lord. Abraham, known for his faith, did not trust God to take care of him, but rather took matters into his own hands and fled to Egypt to escape famine. And when he got there, he gave his wife away to save his own skin. Yes, Abraham sinned against his wife, but ultimately Abraham sinned against God, Genesis 12. Isaac had a love for earthly things, and although he knew that he should have blessed Jacob, Genesis 25, 23, he was willing to violate God's revelation. He was ready to bless Esau, his favorite son. He was willing to mix his own earthly desires with spiritual blessings from God. Yes, Isaac sinned against his wife and his children, but ultimately, Isaac sinned against God, Genesis 27. Jacob deceived his brother and took advantage of his weakness and took his birthright for a bowl of soup. Yes, Jacob sinned against his brother and his father, but ultimately Jacob sinned against God. Genesis 25. How about King David when he looked upon Uriah's wife with lust in his eyes and then he had Uriah killed and he took Uriah's wife to be his wife? Did, what did David say when Nathan confronted him with his sin? Did he say, I have sinned against Uriah? Did he say, I have sinned against Bathsheba? No, he fell to his knees and said, I have sinned against the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Everyone has sinned and falls short of the glory of God without exception. But I use these examples because every one of these men tripped on a stumbling block of their own doing. Abraham sinned to save himself from harm. Isaac sinned because of his love for worldly things. And Jacob sinned because he valued his own will over the Lord's will. And David tripped on his own desires of the flesh. All of these men were willing to gamble their eternal security for earthly desires. Jesus is warning his disciples in this verse. If your own body causes you to sin, cut that part off. 
Get that temptation away from you. Verse 9. And if your eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fiery hell. Verses 8 and 9 contain the same strong language from Jesus. It is meant to shock the reader or the hearer. Graphic mental imagery. It is better to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand to keep yourself from sinning against the Lord than it is to go to hell. It sounds radical. And it's intended to sound radical. Jesus is not promoting self-mutilation here. That's ridiculous, and it's not biblical. We read in God's law, you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord, Leviticus 19.28. Also remember in 1 Kings, when Elijah had a showdown with the prophets of Baal, and these false prophets called repeatedly on their false gods to set their offering on fire, and there was no reply. Let's look at what happened next. Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming or relieving himself, going to the bathroom. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be woken up, 1 Kings 18. And so these worshipers of the false god Baal responded like this. They shouted louder, and following their normal customs, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response, 1 Kings 18. Jesus is most certainly not suggesting anyone mutilate themselves by cutting off a member of their own body. These are occult practices. And to suggest that Jesus was promoting anything of the sort is flirting with the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So be careful with your translation of these verses. Jesus uses this language to draw our attention to the severity of sin in our lives. Stumbling blocks we put in our own path. Cutting off or gouging out a part of your own body sounds radical. But the truth is, the change we as Christians are called to undergo from natural man to spirit-filled man, is far more extreme than simply cutting off your own hand. We are called to become new creatures in Christ. Everything has to change. How we think, how we act, how we speak, how we treat others. We are called to be transformed into the very image of Christ. So even how we look needs to change. And all of this starts with humility. Because without it, like Cain, you will see yourself as greater than your brother. Or like Abraham, you will not trust God to provide for you. Or like Isaac, you will desire the things of the world over the will of God. Or like Jacob, you will lie, cheat, and connive others to fulfill your own will over the sovereign plans of God. Or like David, you will chase after the fleshly pleasures and continue living in sin long after you know better. It was one thing when you were ignorant of God, but now you claim to be a child of the Most High God. So to continue in sin as you did before Christ saved you, well, it would be better off for you to cut off your hand or gouge out your eye than it would be to go to hell. Because if you are using God's grace to practice sin, you are comfortable with your sin, I would question if you are saved at all. I am not preaching sinless perfection. That won't happen until our corruptible flesh is transformed into incorruptible. I am talking about practicing sin and thinking it's all good. God will forgive me. It's not all good. It's all bad. Jesus in these verses is saying, beware of the things that cause sin in your own life. Because if you have truly accepted the free gift of salvation, then you have been freed from the power that sin in the world had over you. You have not been relieved of your sin nature, but you have received the Holy Spirit. And as a believer, when we trip and fall over a stumbling block we put in our own path, we cause ourselves to sin against God. This is a difficult subject. Because we know that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, eight. So it is easy for the self-professed, self-righteous person, one who is still full of pride, yet knows enough about the scriptures because they come to church services for an hour a week, to reason within himself that his sin is just a result of the sin nature that he was born with, and he continues on in his sin. Sexual immorality, worldly pleasures, imposing his own will, grieving the spirit of God, you know, doing things the world's way, and not really giving a flip about it. Practicing sin, that's dangerous. Because if you keep reading on from John 1.8, you will come to this verse. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed remains in him. And he cannot, conti- he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. 1 John 
Jesus says here, if there is something in your life that is causing you to sin, cut it off. Some practical examples of this would be if you're an alcoholic, dump out the bottles of booze you're keeping in your wet bar. Don't hang out with your drinking buddies anymore. If you can't quit looking at porn, shut off the internet access. Cut it off. See, when we come to Christ, he takes us as we are, no matter how broken. When we make that great confession of faith and we proclaim Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives, we instantly change positions from broad road to narrow path, from dark to light, from death to life. We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, all of him, as much as we will ever have. The Holy Spirit does not leak out and need to be refilled. He's not an alkaline battery that runs low and needs to be charged back up. No, when the Bible speaks of the filling of the Spirit, the word filling literally means to be under the influence of, controlled by. It's not like putting gas in your car and it only gets you so far before you have to refill it and make it operate correctly. What doesn't happen at the moment of salvation is we are not relieved of our sin nature that we receive from Adam. It remains in us. We are still sinners. We have been freed from the power that sin had over us, but we are still sinners. So what does that mean? It means that the tendency to sin is still there, and that the temptation to sin is as strong as it ever was. Jesus is warning us not to put ourselves in situations that will result in sin. It is a battle that we will fight for the rest of our lives. And if we are not intentional about being controlled by the Holy Spirit, being under His influence, then ask yourself, what is influencing you? What controls you? If it's not God, what is it? You all seem like a pretty smart bunch, so I will let you answer that question for yourselves. We can become an offense to God in different ways. Jesus uses the phrase stumbling block, and we see that it means a trap or a snare. Sometimes we can blindly walk into a trap or a snare set by another, and sometimes we can see clearly what we are walking into, but choose to proceed anyways. This is what Jesus is warning against here. We know better, but still choose to offend God after all he has done for us. Ultimately, it is our attitude towards sin that determines where your heart's at. If we offend God as a true born-again Christian washed in the blood, we will feel a deep remorse almost immediately, if not during the act of sin itself. God, forgive me. Sin should put us on our knees. We should hate what God hates. We're going to fall. But while you're down there, repent and get back up and start walking close with God. If our attitude towards sin is flippant, or whatever attitude, everybody does it, then you don't hate your sin. You love it or you tolerate it. You may not even see it as an offense. Are you being controlled by the Holy Spirit or by something else? And it's not always the devil. You are very capable of sinning without any help from him. You can absolutely sin by choice. Jesus is saying in these verses here, stop putting yourself in a position to fall. If you're living in sin of any kind, repent and turn away from that lifestyle. We all have weaknesses. And trust me, the enemy knows your weakness. And his minions will tempt you over and over again until you cut it off, gouge it out, and throw it away from you. Verse 10. <clears throat> See that you do not look down... <clears throat> On one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Here in verse 10, Jesus brings the focus back on the little child. The one that is humble, meek, and believes in him. The one that Jesus says will be considered great in his kingdom. Jesus gives his disciples and us yet another warning. See that you don't look down on one of these little children. If it has not already become obvious to all of you, let me spell it out plainly. God places a high value on these little ones. Jesus just told them that they are the greatest in the sight of my father. So as if that was not reason enough to treat these little ones correctly, Jesus goes on to say that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my father who is in heaven. What? These little ones have angels? What kind of angels? I thought angels were just messengers. You mean to tell me that when we accept the free gift of salvation and we become believers in Christ, we are first and foremost saved from hell, more than any of us deserve? But on top of that, we get all these gifts and fruits and promises throughout Scripture, and we also get angels? Well, as always, don't take my word for it. Let's connect the dots here from the Word of God. 
Turn with me to Psalm 91, and let's read it together, starting in verse 1 to verse 11, speaking of the security of the one who trusts in the Lord. One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or by the arrow that flies by day, or of the plagues that stalk in the darkness, or of the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eye, and See the retaliation against the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil will happen to you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. A believer in Jesus Christ is one who dwells in the shelter of of the Most High. And according to the psalmist here, God sends his angels to guard them in all their ways. Probably not a good idea to look down on one of these little ones. While we are in this book, let's back up a few chapters and look at Psalm 34, starting in verse 1. One through seven. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Exalt the Lord with me and let's exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. They looked at him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This wretched man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angels of the the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord rescues those that fear God. Just to be clear, the fear of the Lord is exactly what's missing in the world today. Those that practice sin have no fear of God. God's angels don't just rescue his little ones. They encamp around them. I don't know about you guys, but this is not a camp you want to disrespectfully wander into. This is not a camp you want to look down on. Yeah, that's just Old Testament stuff, though. David wrote those Psalms. God's anointed one. Of course he had angels looking out for him. I mean, he was a man after God's own heart. And God had big plans for him to do. It's different now. There's no angels protecting little Christians, right? Wrong. Let's take a look at this verse in the book of Hebrews. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews 1, 14. Did you guys catch that? The angels are sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So God sends out angels to us even before we accept the free gift of salvation? You better believe it. Think about what Jesus did during his ministry here on earth. He sought the lost. He went out of his way to find the sick. He sought the lost sheep. Remember, God knows how the story ends. There is no tomorrow he has not seen. So even before we confess him Lord over our lives and our hearts, God knows who's going to serve him and who's going to reject him. So he sends out ministering spirits to render service to his little ones. So be careful not to despise one of them. God has big plans for all of us. Just look what his word says. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. Old Testament, New Testament. He is the same God then as he is now. He will never change. He sends his angels to watch over those that belong to him. Even before you realize you belong to him. He is God. So be careful not to despise or look down on or dismiss one of his little ones as nothing. What kind of angels stand in the presence of God? 
Remember when the angel of the Lord came to Zechariah to tell him the news that his wife Elizabeth was pregnant with their child, John the Baptist? The, angels, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Luke 1.19. Jesus says these angels watching out for his little ones continually see the face of his father who is in heaven. The Jews called these angels that stood before God the angels of presence or the angels of the face. This is to behold the king's face, allowed into the king's presence. It is an honor and it declares that the king has confidence in them and has allowed them to enjoy special favor. Similarly to what we see in the book of Esther and in the book of Kings, it is the king's court, if you will, the innermost circle of the king, the trusted servants of the king. This is what the Jewish tradition is referring to with the term angels of the face or angels of the presence. These are the angels that are the most loyal to God, standing in his inner circle, awaiting his orders so that they may swiftly carry them out without question. However, the idea of a guardian angel is a rather narrow view. In every verse that we have looked at, the word angel is plural, as in more than one. Are they not all ministering spirits? For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So if we are going to take God's word literally, then I literally understand that as a child of God, one that is destined for heaven, I can rest assured that Almighty God can and will keep me safe, and he will use all of his endless resources to do so, not just a single angel. I like what one guy writes on this subject. He says, the interpretation given to this passage by some commentators as if God assigned to each believer his own angel does not rest on solid grounds. For the words of Christ do not mean that a single angel is continually occupied with this or the other person. And such an idea is inconsistent with the whole doctrine of scripture, which declares that angels camp around the godly and that not one angel only, but many have been commissioned to guard every one of the faithful. So away then with this fanciful notion of a good and evil angel and let us rest satisfied with holding that the care of the whole church is committed to angels to assist each member as his necessities shall require. John Calvin. I believe Calvin had this exactly right. Not one angel only, but many. Let's look at an event in the Old Testament concerning Elijah and his servant that backs up Calvin's statement biblically. King Aram was making war against Israel. And when he would make his battle plans, Elijah would tell of it to the king of Israel. So King Aram became enraged with Elijah and sought his life. And when he was told that Elijah was in Dothan, he sent a large fighting force with horses and chariots to seize Elijah. And a, number of the, uh, a large number of the Armenian army, so many that they surrounded the whole of the city. And when Elijah's servant looked out from Dothan, his heart sank low. And he proclaimed to Elijah, it is hopeless, master. This guy was panicking at the sight of the Armenians. They had them hemmed up. The servant asked Elijah, what do we do? And Elijah said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are greater than those that are with them. Then Elijah prayed and he said, Lord, Please open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Elijah was not worried because he knew that God was committed to his care and well-being. God does not send a single angel to guard Elijah. No, he sent legions of angels to assist his child as his necessities required. Elijah asked God to reveal to his servant, pull back the curtain, if you will, show him how small and feeble the biggest army of man is, how it measures up against the will of God and his divine protection. But before we get carried away and all starry-eyed over these supernatural beings that take their commands from the mouth of God, let me remind you that the writer of Hebrews also said, to which of these angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? 
Guys, we have something way more powerful than legions of angels. We have Jesus Christ looking out for us. We have the Lord of Lords making intercession for us. We have the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is why Jesus says, whoever receives one of these little ones receives me. Therefore, who are he to the world? And who are he to the person that causes one of these little ones to stumble? Verse 11 Here again, like we saw in Matthew chapter 17, is a verse that appears in some translations in brackets, and it does not appear in other translations at all. It simply skips skips right to verse 12. So let's deal with it. Biblical scholars throughout the ages have compiled two categories of manuscripts. One category is known as the critical texts, and the other is called the majority text. The critical texts are manuscripts that are much older than the majority texts, but there are far fewer of them. Using both categories of manuscripts, scholars have developed a process called textual criticism. This process is able to determine with an incredible amount of accuracy exactly how the original text would have read. When it comes to the New Testament, there are a total of 24,633 manuscripts in existence. There is an article written by John Callahan called How Accurate is the Bible? And it breaks down the process of textual criticism incredibly well. And if you want additional information on textual criticism, I highly recommend reading it. The conclusion of the article says that the Bible is 99.8% accurate and no doctrines are affected. There is no other ancient book in existence with so many copies and so little little error. The Bible is really unique. The Bible is very accurate and we should thank God for keeping his word pure and we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand what he has so carefully preserved for us. Textual criticism has determined that verse 11 in Matthew 18 should not be there because it does not appear in the oldest and best manuscripts. And the inclusion or exclusion of this verse does not change Christ's message or affect any thread of theology or Bible doctrine. Alfred Plummer writes in 1841, the whole of the verse, for the Son of Man came to save that which is lost, is rightly omitted and rejected by all editors. It was probably inserted to make an introduction to the parable of the lost sheep, which follows somewhat abruptly, but the insertion spoils rather than helps the connection between verse 10 and verse 12. So why was it ever included? Where did it come from? Does this phrase appear anywhere else in the Bible? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. We can find it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, when Jesus entered Jericho. You will recall he encountered a tax collector named Zacharias. The tax collector was so anxious to see Jesus, but because of the crowd of people surrounding Christ and him being vertically challenged, Zacharias ran ahead of the mob and climbed a sycamore tree. Let's pick it up in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacharias, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacharias stopped and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I am giving to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anybody, I am giving back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So these words were spoken by Jesus and are recorded correctly here in the Gospel of Luke. However, through the process of textual criticism, it has been determined that this verse does not belong in Matthew chapter 18. In the next three verses, Jesus tells his disciple a parable, a short story. The parable is about 99 sheep and one that goes astray. And immediately it sounds familiar to us. Because recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, Jesus tells the crowd a series of three parables in rapid succession. And the first one is the parable of the lost sheep. The second one is the parable of the lost coin. And the third is the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the lost sheep told in the Gospel of Luke is not related to this shorter parable told here in the Gospel of Matthew. And it does not teach the same truth as the short story we find here. The three parables that Luke's Gospel records all have the same theme. A lost sheep, 
a lost coin, and a lost son. The sheep, the coin, and the prodigal son all represent an unrepented sinner, one that has never put their faith in God. And Jesus was speaking to a crowd of unrepented people publicly. In our verses, Jesus is teaching privately with his pideon, little child, presumably still sitting in his lap, and his disciples all gathered around. He is speaking to believers. He is laying out the blueprint for his church. He is instructing his bride how to act. You guys need to humble yourselves. You guys need to stop competing against each other. You guys need to put the needs of others before your own needs. You need to serve each other. You guys better watch out for stumbling blocks so that you don't get caught in one of these traps or snares. Hey, you guys better not set one of these traps or snares for another to get caught in. Don't cause your brother to sin against me. Then finally, we get the lost sheep in our next verse. The lost sheep is one of these little ones that Jesus is warning all of his followers then and now to be careful not to despise or regard as nothing. Verse 12, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is lost? What do you think, Jesus says? He is looking for their gut reaction. What do you suppose? This is a simple yes or no question. And the obvious answer to the question that Jesus is looking for is yes. Of course the shepherd would go and look for the lost sheep. The lost sheep in this quick parable is a picture of a backsliding Christian. The sheep belonged with the other 99, but he went astray. Jesus does not make known if the sheep was lured away by a stumbling block placed by another or a stumbling block of his own doing, but in the context of the entire discussion that Jesus has been teaching here, it is clear that this little flock of a hundred sheep represent believers in him, followers of him, and Jesus Christ is the shepherd. Jesus rep repeatedly refers to us as sheep throughout the scriptures. Honestly, it is the perfect metaphor. Jesus refers to his followers as sheep and to the world as wolves, the natural predator of sheep. Sheep literally have no sense of direction. They need a shepherd to guide them or they will be lost because sheep are prone to wander off. Like sheep, we are prone to wander off. It was Robert Robertson, inspired by reading Psalm 103, that wrote, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, Daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Christians need the good shepherd or they will get lost. When Jesus taught his disciples the model prayer, he taught them to ask for daily bread. Not monthly, not weekly, not twice a year on the big holidays, not when you look up and realize you're lost, not when the wolf is about to pounce on you, but daily. Give us this day our daily bread. This bread is the word of God, and we must rely on this word and the shepherd daily, or we will be lost. It is hard not to include Psalm 23 right here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows and surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I'm going to do something dangerous here and go off script. You guys have seen this before. That picture right there was taken when we were in Bethlehem. And uh, it was amazing, you guys. They raise sheep in Bethlehem. And um, not just any old sheep. In Bethlehem, they raise Passover lambs. That's what they do there. And they've done it for thousands of years before Christ. And they're still doing it today. And they take these lambs and they anoint their heads with oil. And when they're born, they wrap these lambs in swaddling cloth and they lay them in stone mangers so that they don't blemish themselves because you can't have a Passover lamb that has a blemish. So if that's not a picture of Christ, thousands of years before Christ even came and thousands of years after Christ was there, I really don't know what is. That was an awesome place. We were in the shepherd's fields. We sat in Boaz's cave. Maravet was there. It was an awesome place. But anyways, we'll get back to the... Uh, message tonight. 
Sheep are also quite defenseless. When one goes astray, they are quickly going to be torn to shreds. A sheep is no match against wolves. Jesus was constantly warning of the dangers that his followers would face. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents, as innocent as doves. Matthew 10, 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, 15. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. 1 Peter Two, I know after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, 29. However, the lesson behind and in front every one of these warnings is to stay under the protection of the shepherd and you don't have anything to worry about. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Why? Because if you stay in the flock under the care of the good shepherd, you're sleeping well at night. The whole world can be going to hell in a handbag, and that's exactly what we see happening all around us. But as long as you don't wander off on your own, you have nothing to worry about. When sheep fall down, they cannot get up without help. The Christian is no different. When we stumble and we fall, whether it is a trap placed by the world that we blindly stepped in or a snare of our own doing that we walk into with our eyes wide open, we break fellowship with God. We cannot be in sin and in fellowship with God at the same time. We cannot walk with Jesus and the world simultaneously. Once a Christian has believed in Christ and placed their faith in Him and Him alone, they are eternally saved. But because you have not been relieved of your sin nature that you were born with, sin is still a reality that we have to battle against daily. If Christians remain in sin, God will discipline His children. Like any good father... God the Father corrects those he loves. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12, 6. If you are practicing sin, and your attitude towards sin is, oh well, I'm just a sinner, and there is no discipline from God, then it could well be that God does not call you his son or your daughter, but that you are an illegitimate child. For it is his discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without disciples, you are out without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us in short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our own good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who he has been, that has been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. Like the sheep stuck on the ground after he stumbles and falls, we cannot get up on our own. We cannot get up until we repent and ask God to forgive us. Then the good shepherd will lift you up and put you back into fellowship with him. Sheep cannot carry any weight. Man has used every animal imaginable to carry things from dogs to elephants, but you will never see a sheep with a pack on his back. They are not able to carry burdens. If the sheep are left without the care of the shepherd, they can cripple themselves from the weight of their own wool unless the shepherd relieves them of that burden. Christians likewise are not built to carry weight, the weight of the world. Christ came to relieve us of the heavy load that the world places on us. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Isaiah 58, 6. For they bind 
heavy burdens and grievous them to be born, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them. Luke eleven forty six. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, and you will learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Psalm 55, 22. Like sheep, Christians are not meant to carry a burdensome load. And like the sheep's wool, the weight of our sin will cripple us if the shepherd does not relieve us of it. It is only the good shepherd that is able to relieve these burdens. We were never meant to carry in the first place. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 here in verse 12, Jesus is drawing his disciples' attention to the believer in him that went astray. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he will seek after all that belongs to him. Verse 13, and if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that have not gone astray. Jesus says here that there is more joy over the believer that is restored to fellowship than the 99 that never strayed. Why? Because the 99 were not in danger of falling into sin. See to yourselves how many times a person wanders into our little flock here at Sunrise Bible Church. They're here for a week or two, and they're gone. Sometimes we wonder, what happened to them? I haven't seen so-and-so for a few weeks. Wonder where they've been. Did they go astray? Did they wander off? Or did one of us lay a stumbling block before them? In the preceding verses, beyond this short parable, we will take a much closer look at how easy it is to offend another believer and how often Christians display an inability to extend grace to one another and look down on one of these little ones that belong to Christ and how restoration should always be the goal in any situation between two people that believe in Christ. We are all led by the same shepherd. So if you ever are wondering where did they go, did they wander off, go astray, Rest assured that the good shepherd is out there seeking for them. And he rejoices gratefully if it turns out that they are found. Verse 14. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven for one of these little ones to perish. Jesus closes this parable with this statement. It is not the will of your father who is in heaven for one of these little ones to perish. God takes no pleasure in those that perish. God created all of us in his image, his likeness. Peter wrote in his second letter to Christian believers, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 God spoke these words through the prophet Ezekiel to his people. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Ezekiel 18.23 Christian, even if a brother or sister in Christ is guilty of a wrongdoing, you who are born again are called to help restore them with a spirit of gentleness, all while examining yourself. Paul tells us to bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Paul goes on to say, for if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Paul is talking about how believers are not to be puffed up and looking down at another brother or sister in Christ. The fact that Paul, Peter, John, and Jesus had to deal with these issues within the context of the church is really kind of sad. But we here at Sunrise also need to deal with these issues. We are all one in Christ. So let's get busy serving one another and lifting each other up so that no stumbling block is placed in the path of one of these little ones that belong to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this study tonight, Lord. We ask that this word would just sink deep into the hearts and minds of all that are here, and that there would be edification of your saints, Lord, that there would be understanding and there would be application that they would be able to apply to their everyday lives and their walk with you, Jesus, to bring glory in what little time we have left to you, God. Um, 
We ask that you keep everybody safe as they travel home tonight, and we thank you for this night, Lord. We ask all of these things in Christ's name.